Okay, everyone is still awake? This is the almost final session, so I'm gonna warm everything up for you, Magnus. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I'm gonna talk about Azure plug and play architecture. So you might be familiar with plug and play architecture, maybe back from the days from the Commodore where you plug stuff in and then you can play around with uh, some of your hardware or maybe with games um, when you have a game console. And I have something similar w when it regards to Azure with all these services you have, which you can build something up that's valuable for the customer as well in the end. So before I start, um, it's good to meet you. It's the first time that I'm in Finland. So I've been to Norway quite a few times, Sweden, Denmark, but now it's the first time here. So I'm honored to be here. So thanks for the organization, also you guys for attending. I'm from Codit, so um, that's an international company uh, based out of Belgium. Um, they also have a Dutch branch, so I'm from the Codit the Netherlands. I'm an MVP for eight years. I used to do BizTalk, so that's, that's why you see some of those books there. But those are the early days, so I transitioned into Azure a couple of years ago, and I'm doing kind of integration since then, so it's a couple of years now, four or five. Um, I'm also an editor for InfoQ, so I also sometimes write articles about different cloud providers as well, which you will see in this presentation too. The other thing I like to do is running marathons. So that's why I still keep up and healthy and don't burn myself out being uh, behind the computer all the time. So I did a few marathons, you see New York here, uh, Rotterdam, and I'm planning to do another one in February in Tokyo. Enough said, so what can you expect in this session? So we we'll talk a bit about Azure Playground as a metaphor, some of the trends, use cases, scenarios, demos, some of the stuff you've already seen before today, some considerations, some life uh, or real world scenarios as well, some lessons learned. So what I do see Azure is kind of a playground. It's like you have all these services you can start building or try these things out, whether it be in a POC or proof of architecture, to really start learning what the service basically could do for you, or you make a combination of services to create a final solution for customers. So that's how I looked at Azure, and I thought, you know, why don't you just do a kind of a session about this? Because Azure has quite a few playgrounds. That means they've got like data centers across the globe, right? So it's about I think 36, but it could be mistaken that there are more, there are a few planned. And most of these data centers have all, all types of services. If it's a ring zero service, it means that it's everywhere, but sometimes the service is not available in certain regions and it is in other regions. But it's where you can find all these services. And I'll get back to playgrounds also by other cloud providers. And I do see it a little bit as a, a metaphor also towards Lego. I used to play with Lego. Who played with Lego in the, in the early days? See, most of you guys eventually played with this great Danish invention, building either a house or a boat, or even I know that someone is collecting a lot of uh, Star Wars uh, Lego, but they're like Pirates of the Caribbean. There's all tons of Lego where you can really build um, yeah, basically also uh, a solution or at least something you, with your creative mind, want to build. And you could similarly do that with solutions in Azure if you look at what they provide, right? These are the platform services. You have like uh, media, you have application, you have data, you have intelligence. You already saw something with a uh, conversational bot what was interesting. I have a few samples of that as well. So you can pick and choose some of these services, build some security and management around it, and then in the end even deploy it. It's all there, it's, it's pretty big. And that's why I think you know you could plug and play with these type of services to, in the end, create your solution. So let's look at a bit of trends of technology life cycles, if you want. So if you look at the technology life cycles, where you now have people that are start innovating, taking risks, working with previews. You saw uh, Elder doing a great session on IoT Edge, which is like ble uh, bleeding edge technology, but it's still preview. So it means that you cannot show it in the end, even if you want to. Sometimes things break. The thing, thing you find with machine learning and also in AI. So those are kind of the um, early things. Then you've got something like uh, container orchestrations or data science, which is starting to pick up now. And you see multiple cloud vendors um, supporting Kubernetes in their offerings. Then you get more to the kind of early mainstream where you can find microservices and containers. And then more in the late majority, same things that you already know is like the Java and .NET type of languages. Um, if you look at more earlier language like Node and Go, you'll find them early in the innovation space again. So the farther you go to the, to the right, you're getting more into a conservative area. And then, of course, you have things like serverless, which is getting, uh, starting to get more momentum and mainstream. And the other thing is like databases. There are some there, too. You've got, of course, the relational databases, SQL. They're known for quite a while. But you also have now the NoSQL, which is available also in one of the new offerings of Microsoft, which is Cosmos DB. 
which I'll be talking about as well. Okay, so let's go into AI. So would this be the future? That robots would take over the world and eventually destroy us like we've seen in the movie Terminator? Robotics is a thing, so uh, Amazon is using it uh, in their um, logistics areas, in their uh, warehouses and stuff. They don't even have any humans anymore. It's all robotized. Uh, you have things like artificial intelligence, which is picking up. You got things like machine learning, big data. Um, you got surveillance even. You can walk in a store and then just monitor where you walk and kind of profile what you as a customer would like. Let's say if you're in a clothing shop or somewhere else. That happens already today. The other fact is, and this is a bit scary, it also monitors the, the people that are a sales assistant if they're doing their job well. So there's a flip side to it as well. So that's quite interesting with the evolution of AI. There's certain AI platforms. So Amazon's really uh, digging into this. You've got IBM with Watson, you've got Google, you've got Facebook, which uses the algorithms to kind of filter your life, basically, because you only get to see based on what you like. So it's putting a filter in front of you and only providing the details and information you, they think are interested in. So there's a lot of algorithms behind it. And of course, you also have Microsoft that is pretty active in this space as well. <coughs> and you can see this in the AI platform. So you've already seen conversational AI, you've seen pre-built AI, and you've seen, you haven't seen custom AI, but this is like machine learning. So with Machine Learning Studio, you effectively can build up a predictive model. For instance, you could use it for predictive maintenance. There's infrastructure under it, which you can use to compute. You can do Hadoop and Spark and do type of stuff on there, or you just store all that data, maybe for later analysis. So this is a big, pretty big platform that Microsoft is offering and is building up. There's some customer cases too. So I already talked about, you know, if you walk in a store that they monitor you, there's like uh, help to go which is an app that can help people that are, have certain disorder and are not able to express themselves with language, but then they can use it through images. So that's, an, uh, an, for instance, a use case. Another way is would be conversational, uh, an API which UPS used to track your package. You could say, okay, where's my package? And then that could help or that could work. The other thing would be, let's say, Alexa Home with Echo, so who owns an Echo? Or the one that Microsoft recently brought out? Cortana, so I have one at home, but I never switch it on because I'm afraid that they could eavesdrop because it has to listen all the time because it needs that stop word, Cortana or Alexa. But even, for instance, law enforcement in the US is using AI to detect people in certain areas. They just go through video streaming and find out if the certain person was there that they are looking for. That kind of thing happens as well. You can also do sentiment analysis. This is one of the demo I built. I'm not going to show this, but it's based on Twitter. So I you know, collected all the tweets from Twitter from uh, Mr. Trump, and he accumulates a lot of noise. Send them to text analysis and then find out what the sentiment would be. But eventually, it me, uh, what I've learned also last year at Microsoft, that also Microsoft uses sentiment analysis for everything that happens on Twitter, and what they people say about their products or s as such. And what happens, they're using Logic App in the background. If it hits a certain score, it will go to CRM, and eventually, if it hits a certain threshold, if somebody, listen, let's say, does two or three negative tweets, they just to contact, not negatively, but say, hey, what's going on? How can we help you? So effectively, this might look, this is a demo I just played around, just assemble it, but actually Microsoft is using this. And this is also happening effectively on Wall Street because they're monitoring everything Trump is saying because it could affect Wall Street, right? So this happens. Now I've tried to build a demo myself, but I wanted also to consume not just only cognitive services by Microsoft, but also the one offering by AWS, recognition service. I believe someone from AWS was in, in the crowd. Or is he gone with his flash uh, bottle of champagne? <laughs> right. And you have Google Vision API. So all of them are available in the platform using some type of thing with cognitive services, detecting facing, uh, faces and such. So what I will do is I will open my application. Let me just... Because this is how I do UIs, the old way with a very nice Windows form. Yeah, exactly. I used to do VB in the old days. So, you all recognize who this is? 
right? It's a rat. Smiling guy, right? Okay, so let's first call Amazon recognition and see what the output would be. He, for 60%, sometimes has a beard. That's funny. He looks happy. He's not so confused, but I would think it's the other way around. And in here you can see the age range. So they think he's between 90 and 60. So this is a recognition service, a pretty sophisticated service what Amazon is offering. Now I'm calling the Computer Vision API from Microsoft. Again, I get a nice JSON output. So it doesn't detect any facial hair. Let me just go down a bit. It does indicate that it's a male, and they think he's about 52 years old. So yes, what color can do with an image. Chris, you're right. Now let's go to the Google Vision API. So that's another API you can consume, but what the Google one doesn't do is age or anything. It just con uh, concludes some traits. So it indicates that this is a business guy, which is fairly true, an entrepreneur, a diplomat, but not like age or anything. So this API is totally different type of capability than the other two. So this is how they differ a bit. It's not that one API is maybe better than the other, they just have different specifics. And the nice thing though is you can consume all these APIs using .NET, so that's pretty cool. You either use the NuGet package from AWS or you use the Cloud SDK you install and then you can also consume those services. So this means that you are not bound to a certain platform if you want to use some of these AI type of capabilities. Right, so just to give you a demo of face recognition, but then over multiple cloud platforms, because they're all kind of offering similar services. The things I've learned of seen is if you build up this type of solution is your workloads, because cognitive services have different SKUs. You have a free SKU, but it means you can't stress it too much, because then you get into throttling issues and you get uh, like a, a 429 HTTP errors type of thing. So you have to think about if you build this solution, what's intentionally going to be your workload and what type of cost are you going to run into. The other interesting thing is the GDPR rule, which will be effectively in May. So this could also impact this type of solutions because it would be funny, oh yeah, I'm doing face detection or I'm going to use it for prosecution or I'm going to follow you around if you're in a store, but effectively could you do that? And how secure is it? Even if you use it for your own um, need, how secure is it? Because if it gets exposed, I've learned 4% from the annual revenue, right? That's what you've told me. So that's kind of the flip side, building these type of solution up. If you leak data about certain prior people, then you could run into issues. And the other thing is, the other way is this is very useful if you collect all this data because you can do big data. So you can run all kinds of algorithms and get all kinds of type of knowledge. And this could be good, but this could also be bad. So if, for instance, you could use Watson to, for instance, try to learn about certain diseases and try to um, do a diagnosis pretty quickly. So that could be of good use, but you can also use the information as a, an insurance company to prevent that you be even taken on or they would raise your premium. So there's flip side to, to this all AI kind of stuff. I think it's very good even the conversational part, we just help you out, hey, what's my ticket or that kind of stuff, that was a good demo, but certain other solutions, you have to think about these type of things. So that's one thing I want to talk to you about. And there's also, with regards to GDPR and how it will affect society, Microsoft has just, what I've learned yesterday, put this book out so you can get it. It's the future computer, artificial intelligence, and a role in society. So you can get this book, it's about 70 or 80 pages, if you're really interested into this subject as well. Okay, let's continue. Serverless, another one of my passions because I like to do serverless because I don't have to do much coding, everything is abstracted away. Although there's still servers somewhere down in the data center, but it's, you know, it's abstracted away by all these capability that Microsoft offers, which they usually tend to call platform as a service. They just rebrand it into serverless, but it was already there. And if kind of, they're not the only one. So if you compare this to the other two cloud providers, Amazon and Google, they're doing the same thing. So it's kind of a free horse race 
type of thing. And as an InfoQ writer, I'm not bound to Microsoft only. I have to write about the other stuff too. So I'm kind of seeing these things going around. So I have to explore all these other platforms and they're kind of, you know, they're following each other in all the way around, around all these services and capabilities they bring out. Or supporting, for instance, Kubernetes. They all support Kubernetes somehow in their service. And then they use not ACS, but AKS. This kind of funny thing they all do. It's just kind of that they all are playing this game, right? They just sit together, such an Agela and the guy from Google, Vissos and the, whoever runs Google, but you know, they're just playing and trying to conquer the world with their playgrounds. So this is, you know, just to give you a sense, these are all the data centers that AWS is out and they're planning for more. And recently they already created, had a data center out in Paris. And on the other end, Google is doing the same thing. If you just plot them over together, yeah, Microsoft is leading in a number of regions, but you see all these others uh, there as well, right? So it's kind of a competition going on, all of them providing their capabilities and trying to lure these customers into their platform, even with it bound, if they're bound to, let's say, regulations. That's why there's one in Germany, there's one in France. They just want to get the people in and say, well, hey, if your data can leave the country, we'll put it in our data center. And then Google said, yeah, but we have a data center too, and Microsoft as well. So they're following each other. So it's kind of interesting. Also with this serverless. So if you look serverless through my eyes, I do integration a lot, then I can see three things. So it's serverless compute provided by functions. You have logic apps, which is kind of with triggers and actions, which you can just do a business flow. And you've got event grid, which is like eventing. And it's all type of serverless, which you can attach to databases, storage, you can set up security around it, IoT, stream analytics and even intelligence, even AI. You can all kind of build solutions ar around it. You can either do it locally, which you saw Alex do, but you can also do this in the cloud. There's multiple ways how you can develop these solutions with different types of experience. If it's debugging, then you're better off locally than doing this in the cloud with a browser. So I've got another solution built up. Again, what I'm using here is multiple parts. So I really assemble this to create a solution which applies OCR, which is optical character recognition. So you're all consultants, developers, and probably can do expenses. Who cannot do expenses? See, almost no hands. So you all do expenses, right? So what you could do, you could submit your receipt through, let's say, uh, Microsoft Flow on your phone or Power App, which then sends it off to storage. In the storage, I set up events grid. So that's being set up out of the box. It's then an event source, as you learned yesterday. It will send out an event message, which will then be sent or at least taken up by a function which handles this event by getting the URL out of the event message in the data part, send it over to OCR, which is a part of the capability of Computer Vision ABI. And then the output could be sent to a service queue. So let's have a look at Flow. And Flow could be instantly instantiated, let's say, on your mobile phone with just a button click. Let's say this would be on my mobile phone. I will run the Flow, but the only thing we'll do is just pick up the message and put it in storage. So it will end up in storage. But this will result instantly into an event. So let's switch over to, uh, let me go to, this is my storage, so here it is. And here it will be sent out because you can set up handlers which are kind of topics inside event grid and they will handle it. The interesting thing is that they just, I think pretty recent, in also put in some metrics. So before that you couldn't see the above part, so this is kind of new. So it does tell me that there were a few published and eventually also matched. So you even have metrics, so this has been recently added. So it's kind of interesting that they've added this capability just now. So with the request bin, this might take a bit of time. Let me just switch back to give you a little bit of sense of the topics. So you can see image analysis and the other one, 
and it's based on top of intelligent routing using prefixes or postfixes. So the request bin is just subscribing to all the events, while the function is only subscribing to the events to a certain blob storage, <coughs> and then to a certain type, which is JPEG. Now let me see if this already worked. Yes. So what would be interesting here is that you can see the put blob. So it's topic subject, event type, event time, ID, those are kind of the mandatory fields, and the data one. And the data one, as you can see, can also contains the URL. And the URL is something I need inside my function to eventually present that to a cognitive service API. So it can, and also can call these API through a restful manner. And I just download the JPEG and then just <coughs> offer this to the cognitive services, which will then provide me a result back. And to show you the behavior of it, it's something similar that also Chris showed. You can even test this out. So the behavior is this is my parking receipt, and this is kind of the text, and there was a parking a receipt for 30 euros for parking, and this would be the type of JSON output, which you could also observe if I go to the monitoring tab. While we do this, okay, it's there three minutes ago. And here, you can kind of see what's being logged and also the output. And the output subsequently is also sent to a queue. So with functions, you can have multiple bindings, you can have multiple in and outputs. So it returns a 200 or 202 to the HTTP, to the event grid saying, okay, got the message. And it will also place this message into a queue. As you can see, this is the output. And this subsequently could be further processed um, by another process, put into CRM or other EP system, and in the end, uh, end up be you being, as a consultant, reimbursed. Yes? Do you do service bus 360 a lot? For, yes, for customers, I use a lot of service bus 360 to be able to look into the queue. I used to use the service bus explorer, yeah. but you know, I'm using this tool quite a lot. But I also could use like what Mike Martin showed, Siberata, Surlurin, there's another one you could use. So there are multiple tools out there enabling you to enable, like the Azure Explorer is another one. Yeah, so there's quite a few tools out there that can you help to look into what happens into the, uh, the queue. Now also had a business case. So I actually really put some of these serverless components in use for a company in the Netherlands that was doing environmental control for um, greenhouses, which you can find in the West. So we do a lot of uh, crops inside greenhouses and non-residential buildings. So it's kind of an IT type of solution they build and provide and also management solutions. And what they also did is like they did classroom training. So there's a global company, so they flew in people and then they had this classroom training on-prem with, um, and in one way, I would say also a lot of costs. And they think, you know, why don't we do this through a cloud-first approach and just harness all our knowledge into on-demand training and put it in a SaaS solution and have people do consume that knowledge and training in that way. So that's how they approach cloud-first. And they thought, okay, let's do Microsoft on less. So they ended up in the cloud provider Azure. Minimal code and type of a uniform landscape use as much serverless components as possible. So the solution looked a little bit like this. So all the partners and customers were in CRM and their emails or identities were pushed over to the learning management system 365. And as soon as they started any of the courses, an event would be raised and they were listened to through a webhook mechanism. The webhook mechanism resulted in the fact that a complete event was trimmed to a certain fields we were interested in. So the email, uh, what type of course and the status. And this was subsequently being picked up by a web job where it contains some certain functions to send this over to a logic app, which would then push that into dynamic CRM. Instead of using the CRM online SDK, because that would involve a lot of code, and we want to just leverage the fact that logic app was offering a connector, which you just saw in the other um, example as well, building a serverless application in a little and or seven-ish minutes with Salesforce because they offer an API which you can easily extract using a connector. And even Logic App now offers custom connectors, so you even build your own. 
So you can completely abstract that all away and create almost type of a serverless solution in the cloud. Eventually, what was really beneficial for these customers was the fact that they had a complete data set of their customers, but also what type of training they were following, and et cetera, et cetera. So they could abstract that data set and then use it in a visualization using Power BI. But that's what they could do themselves. But this connection, it was like a little bit too much IT still for them. And the other thing is they could also do now marketing automation, et cetera. So this was really a useful connection for them or a server solution. So the type of things you could consider here, uh, at least for this solution, was the cost of implementation. They didn't have large budgets for this, but this really fitted because you could have built this solution pretty fast. The thing though was that with the CRM online, it has a subset of the real CRM system, so it didn't have like constraints and such. And the other thing was because it's still a transactional system because there's a kind of a database behind it, you could end up in race conditions, meaning because of the burst events, a web job, functions, they all auto scale and they can handle it. But it could be that you start a course and also enroll, but then you would still be enrolled according to the overview in CRM. So that's why we had to implement a logic app and put it in as a, or not logic app, a, a web job and run it as a singleton to prevent that. So it's more that the end goal, your target, was not able to consume all those transactions. The other thing we found out is that when there was an error, you would think, okay, it's a connector inside Logic App, then I'll contact the Logic App team. No, it was the CRM team who actually built that connector. So effectively, if you run into an issue, sometimes you have to think, okay, who am I going to call? Am I going to call the implementer, going to reach out through Yammer or whatever channel to a certain Microsoft product group? But then you have to know who owns it. And the other thing around what I experienced with this particular customer is that they say, okay, we don't want to do any preview technology. So back in the days when we implemented this, we could not use the service bus connector in Logic Apps. So we had to divert into this type of alternative um, architecture. So this is something you could run and potentially, if you're at a customer, that hey, you are this cool and good this was state of the art. And, oh, wait a minute, I want proven technology or at least want to see that it works. Right, so I could continue with all these things that happen in the cloud and go on, but I also wanted to touch upon Cosmos DB. So that's one of the newest services out there in, in, in Azure. It's the Swiss Army Knife. They've got some competitors too, so Amazon has got DynamoDB and Google got Cloud Spanner, so they're kind of similar. But what really stands out here that this is kind of a global service. Um, it supports all types of NoSQL models, if it's key value, column family, document, or even the graph. And it's all the different ways with different APIs which you can abstract that data out of your model. So some of the characteristics that it's global, turnkey, it's multi-model, multi-API, it's a platform as a service, so it auto scales. It's got uh, five sets of uh, consistency models, so it's either very strong, or eventual means either you can either have a very consistent but little less performance or the other way around. It has very low latency and it provides good SLA. So it's kind of the characters out of the box what this new service offers. And what I want to go to is, okay, I got this service, it's cool and new, I saw that build, and then I was working at this customer and they were like, hey, wow, a new type of database? Because they were wor looking for to create a new knowledge base, but state-of-the-art technology in Azure, because they wanted to go completely platform as a service, but they also wanted the capability that really provides strong relations between content. Now you could do the relational database, but it will only, only go to, let's say, one or two levels deep, and then you only hit a performance uh, threshold, similar to documents. So they were using Solar, and it was great for indexing and search, but it wasn't sufficient for related content. You had to calculate it and such. That didn't work. And the nice thing about Cosmos DB was they had Graph. And Graph is very suitable to set really strong relations because the Graph is also a model you find in Facebook and LinkedIn and such. They use this. And eventually the business requirement is like, okay, maybe this could be like, okay, if we set up a new platform in Azure because we want to migrate it from one to the other, then we can also increase the quality with using um, a graph. And the other thing they wanted to know is, you know, the investment in development, in deployment support, and all the way, they really were into DevOps. They wanted to get rid of IS or any virtual machine or you know, on-premise machine. They really wanted to go into a platform as a service solution for their knowledge base and for also for other of their services. 
So this is kind of how this architecture looks like. So it's around tax laws. So these tax laws are all important. It's pretty static contact, but then it's enriched with news, with jurisprudence, comments, etc. And then it gets it's into what is a content constitution phase, which means okay, we do some meta tagging and on such. And in the end, it's being put into a data store for indexing and search, and also eventually for setting the relations. So the building blocks look like this. So you got .NET to do the importing and such, and then you got the content collection. And what we used here was the graph for the relations, that's the meta model around these text laws, which were eventually stored in Cosmos DB, Document DB, but also some of the tags and metadata was stored as a graph to really set up the relations, which I will show you in a demo. And the content itself, all the content, was just stored in Document DB and subsequently integrated with Azure Search because the capability they had in Solar wasn't so difficult. And they were pretty happy and satisfied to have a pre-built type of search engine, which is Search, which is based on Elastic. So you had CMS output, the data, the whole content is stored in Document DB and all the related, let's say, metadata is put into a graph. And then the document DB is kind of being pushed through a pull mechanism into search, creating a collection, building up an index, and putting an API in front of it. Similar to another API being put in front of the graph, which leveraged then Gremlin, which is an open source type of thing to do the traversals from nodes, vertices, and from one node to the other through uh, vertices. And then you have a front end. To make it more, um, to explain it a little bit better, is you put in, let's say, dividend text. This is something Dutch. It will go to the content straight away. It will serve up that content pretty fast, but subsequently it will also call the related content to get all the news items around this dividend text, et cetera, et cetera, and serve that up into the related content. And if you click one of the related content, then it will go back to the content and serve that up. So that's kind of a little bit how we architected this in conjunction also with Microsoft Redmond um, helping us out, particularly in the graph area because that was pretty new to us as well. So what I will show you a little bit is the, the graph itself. Now don't get scared, because it looks like this. This is just a subgraph of all the comments on tax laws. So you have publications like leading comments, um, subsequent comments, and in-depth comments. And this is kind of how that graph looks like, and I'm using the Graph Explorer. I could do this in the Azure portal, but then we have to wait, and then you cannot talk, no panel, nothing, it will take ages. This is a way better tool to use and explore your graphs. You also can get a subgraph by doing you know, this type of metadata around this dividend tag. So I'm really creating a subgraph now. And this might take some time as well, for, so this is why it's not really suitable if you want to index and use it to serve up your content pretty fast. So that's why the document DB comes in. And then you see this type of subgraph of a certain of dividend tag, see? And you can play around with it, really nice. Looks like a spider. So this is what you could do. And quickly, just to give you how would search friends look like, you can do this in the um, portal as well, or you can use Postman and just uh, use the API itself and just click on it and then you can see it's pretty fast, it serves just up the content itself. And if I switch back to this is just C, this is just some of the tags you can see, while the other one's complete content. <coughs> okay. So, what we learned here is that not, we couldn't put everything in one database model, so we had to leverage two. Again, we were facing some of the preview stuff with Cosmos DB Graph, not the Cosmos itself, but the graph type of thing, but we were helped out by Microsoft, so we reached out and we were pretty helpful. And the other thing is costs. So who thinks Cosmos DB is expensive? Because last time I was doing this talk, they were like, oh, it's bloody expensive, you know? I, mean, I don't like Cosmos DB, but it depends on, I think, the business case in the end. This customer had a knowledge base with a subscription model, had a good revenue stream, and they looked into this, but they wanted the proof of architecture first. So they were using, uh, for Cosmos DB, you can even do capacity planner. You just serve up all those documents, and it will calculate the number of request units, which is kind of the, the, the measurement for how you 
estimate cost for this service, and we ended up with a couple of hundred euros a month. So that was like the total cost of ownership. So it wasn't that high versus you know, the complete revenue stream they had with their service anyway. So it would justify the cost in, from that perspective. So they didn't think Cosmos DB was too expensive. But then again, through the proof of architecture, just some of the things I showed you, and the cost, et cetera, we were able to prove that this would be a good technology for them to going forward with this knowledge base in Azure. So, just to wrap things up for you, Azure involves in many areas. You saw the panel discussion yesterday, you saw this. You know, I touch Azure every day. Um, currently, I'm doing also Kubernetes and I run around uh, with Docker and et cetera. So that's, that's my current thing and the current customer. But you know, it involves in, in many areas. If it's AI, big data, serverless, it's all these broad range of technologies you can see and where you can play with just by you know, turning on the service and finding out how it would work. And maybe even a combination of, which you just saw me doing with the surface type of solution. The other thing you might have to uh, think about too is when you're at a certain customer that there might be an architect that just hears the new buzzword and that's the flavor of the day and everything has to be a function and the next day is like, no, 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 logic apps. And then, so these times things happens too, what I experience in the field as well, that you have someone that just hears some new buzzword and then, you know, we call that flavor of the day and that's, we're heading down that direction. And the other thing, it's hard to keep up in a certain way. Even what you heard yesterday in the panel discussion, four very smart guys and still they say, oh, we don't know everything either. So it's really hard to keep up. And the other thing is, although you did see me do all this type of stuff and you think, oh, this is easy, there's still things you need to think about. Whether it be the deployments, whether it be security, whether it be regulations. So it might sound easy, but it is not. There's a lot of things under the hood. You can build a serverless solution in seven minutes, yeah, for sure, but there are still some other things to think about. So, before I end up, so, you know, what I talk about and what I do, you can find this there. So there's InfoQ articles about AI I've written, um, uh, about Kubernetes and all that stuff. It's a really nice platform. InfoQ just has a broad range of news articles spanning around what really happens in the cloud space, not just Microsoft, but everything. You got the Azure, uh, Azure AI platform, if you want to look into that, or serverless computing, or Cosmos DB. I sometimes do vlogs, so some of these things I'm explaining here, I'm also doing what's called the middle of Friday, so it's a kind of a vlog. I do this together with Ken Weir, who usually does all the stuff around Flow, or Integration Mondays, or even where you want to experiment around too. Another really good resource, I think, is edX, because it offers you ways to learn technology, but also do some of the hands-on labs. So that also that helped me playing around with some of these technologies and really dive into it and see what the actual value could be if I would apply it somewhere in a certain architecture. So I want to thank you. And I think this says QA, but I think this means this, right? Quality assessment. Do fill this in. It's not Q&A questions, it's about quality assessment, right? And if you want to reach out to me, you know, just you, you can find me for my Twitter handle. I think that's a, that's a good way to find me. I'm out there. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the last session, which will come up. And thanks for for joining me. <laughs>